Hello and welcome to First Friday Fertility. I'm Dr. Perry. It's good to be back and I'll be able to do more of the fertility myths. We had so many uh, last round, I didn't get through them all. And so I'm going to go, I'm going to actually start out with a lot of the things on the male side uh, for myths. I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about miscarriage risks. I'm going to be uh, talking about stress and the psychology. So I think uh, men, uh, miscarriage and uh, um, being very anxious, uh, I think are going to be the core things, even a little bit of the financial myths as well. So we'll cover a lot of bases, but uh, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, it's a lot of fun to do this. And uh, I think next time I'll be doing it back from the home base in uh, Madison, uh, doing it out in Monroe right now. Um, in terms of the first uh, myth I want to start with, the first myth is that infertility is a female problem. Now, we do have to acknowledge Women are more complex. They are more, have more things going on. There's a lot more happening for the reproductive process for women because you have to address the uterus, tubes, and ovaries, um, and all of them can have uh, an issue occur. But it takes two to tango, and absolutely a male factor can be an issue. Classically, people have talked about a male infertility accounting for about uh, 50% of infertility. I would say it's more in the 20% range. Um, again, I do think women have a lot more that is happening, but we absolutely see this all the time where men say, oh, I'm fine. And there's that machismo that there can't be anything wrong with them because they don't want to accept problems as part of their gender identity. Um, but it actually is. In fact, I had a guy just this week um, who said, it couldn't be me. I'm uh, I have two, no, he actually had three kids from a previous relationship. What we did is analysis. He's firing blanks. I mean, there are about 200,000 total modal sperm. The average guy is about 60 to 80 million. So, you know, uh, 300, 400 times that. And it takes 10 million sperm for one to find an egg. So if he's shooting 200,000, um, that means maybe once every four years, one sperm would find an egg. It's not just that he is a part of the source. He may want to do some paternity testing from those previous relationships uh, based on where those numbers are. So this absolutely matters for things. Another myth talking about guy, guy things is that cold showers can make a man more fertile. Um, I always think back to the Seinfeld episode where, you know, George Costanza is there, it's shrinkage, you know, screaming. Um, unless you're bathing in liquid nitrogen, which I do not recommend under any circumstances, um, you are not preserving the sperm. Um, and so there is really no benefit to cold showers. Um, the concept really comes from the fact that if um, the testes were to overheat, then um, if... The overheating is bad for the sperm, then the reverse will be good. It doesn't quite work like that. Now, granted, I don't think guys should be doing tons of work within hot tubs, um, you know, boiling the sperm, saunas, all those things that can add up. Um, try to avoid uh, those. But at the same time, um, freezing doesn't help. Hey, Lana, good to see you. Um, hey, Takara, a lot of uh, people I'm now seeing for things. Um, yeah, so don't, freezing the sperm doesn't work. Now, for how do you avoid boiling the sperm? Now, first, boxers versus briefs, that is a come. Hey, Rachel! Um, um, boxers versus briefs, that does not uh, make any difference. There are some studies that can show a little bit of change in sperm uh, parameters. I have never seen a study... Uh, convincingly show that was done with a large uh, population that uh, using uh, boxers really changed the pregnancy rate. Hi, Crystal. Um, the um, Now, that being said, if your husband shows up and he's in some ripped and torn tidy whities and he looks really silly, he may not have a chance. Yes, that might cause some degree of some fertility and uh, decrease the odds. But for the most part, boxers versus briefs doesn't matter. What does matter for things? Um, hi, good morning, Artanomi. Um, good to see you. Um, the um, what does 
matter for heating. Um, I think hot tubs rarely done, probably not that big of a deal. Um, however, if you, what I do see a lot of people do is laptops on the lap. If you're having a laptop on your lap, there's often a heat vent underneath it um, for things, and that can have a very negative effect. Um, let's go on a variation and a tangent. Enhancement workout affect sperm. Can you tell anything by the appearance of the sperm? Uh, that's what was asked by Lana. There is no lifestyle modification, hi Bryce, um, that can really change things for the sperm. The number one thing that determines whether a sperm will work is the DNA. And again, no um, particular workout will change the DNA of the sperm. The thing is, as long as you're avoiding being boiled. Now, again, if you're doing hot yoga, for example, that can boil the sperm. Um, but the laptops on the lap um, are the number one thing that I kind of worry about um, that I see a lot of people uh, doing for things. Uh, oh, I was wondering, I was trying to figure out who that was. Uh, uh, hi, I'm Andrea. I was like, I there's something, I'm, but I can't see the picture. It's all so slow, minimally magnified. Hey, Susan, uh, that all makes sense. Okay. Um, so anyway, I would not worry about the boxers versus the briefs. I would not worry. Again, laptops on the lap. The one thing also, though, you do watch for is obesity. Again, if the guy weighs 300 pounds, it's as though the sperm were, the um, testes were internalized. You want the testes outside of the body because it drops the temperature two degrees. And uh, they've done studies where they show that if the testes or scrotal temperature is elevated by um, uh at two, two degrees, um, you take a guy from completely fertile to completely sterile. So you definitely want to uh, make sure um, that if a guy has too much weight and then has low sperm counts, that he loses the weight for things. Um, steroids absolutely can have a negative effect. Now, that's there's a um, good question on that line. You have guys who think, oh, I'm virile, therefore I'm more fertile. I actually knew a bodybuilder back when I was in Louisville who um, uh, we used to have our dogs at the park together and walk out uh, all the time. And then he got busted for steroids. He was a bodybuilder. And he said, oh, he was taking for fertility. Now, first, I talked with him a million times. He had never talked with me once about fertility um, for things. So I think that was kind of the excuse. The other thing is he said, oh, my doctor had said, if I go on testosterone, that will improve fertility. That is the absolute worst thing you can do. If you are taking testosterone, the brain senses, I have got enough male hormone, I don't need to make more. And so it drops the signal to the testicles, which in turn can keep it from making sperm and eggs. And so that's a, that completely is counterproductive. So we see guys uh, who go on testosterone and they're the anytime a guy comes in who's buff even if he doesn't admit it I'm very suspicious for uh, testosterone use um, and again usually the oral supplements don't cause that much but when you see guys uh, using injectables or some of the again um, prescribed um, gels those things can really knock out the uh, sperm counts for things let's just answer a few more questions here for things Hey, Lauren. Hey, Cynthia. All kinds of good people that I know and love here. It's, it's, it's wonderful being part of a good community. I, I appreciate you guys. Um, the Another thing that's a myth for male factor fertility that people talk about is that lubricants make the sperm more slippery and help the sperm get where they need to be. And that is absolutely a myth. Um, you know, there... There's a guy who's, you know, I have this happen where couples, they've been trying for several years. The guy, they come in, they're saying, well, we don't see why we're getting pregnant. And I happen to ask, oh, you're using a spermicidal lubricant. I think I might see a little bit of the problem here. And again, you have to keep a straight face and be respectable because honestly, people are good at what they do. And it's easy enough to hear a myth and get uh, caught up and lost in it. And so that happens. Um, but yes, lubricants actually tank sperm motility. Um, they can actually take it from fully modal to 0% within 15 minutes to half hour uh, routinely for things. So you don't want to use most lubricants. There are commercial lubricants that are sperm friendly, and you see this with pre-seed and others. Um, but at the same time, uh, that's um, honestly, okay. 
So this is what to do versus what not to do. This pre-seed costs $5 a single use. If you go to the kitchen and grab olive oil, you know, you're going to make a salad, you can make a baby. The olive oil works just as well. Um, for uh, keeping sperm alive. Now, again, that can lead to vaginal infections. You're probably not supposed to do that, but again, just be aware there are less expensive ways of going about it. Um, just to scroll down a bit. Hey, Heidi. Hi, Misha. Hi, Amanda. Hey, Mandy. Hey, Meredith. Lots of great people on here. Thank you. Um, so absolutely, lubricants uh, can have a very detrimental effect on sperm, so be conscious about what you're using for things. Okay. Let's start getting into some of the things for miscarriage and adoption. So one of the things that people bring up for adoption is you're more likely to get pregnant after you adopt. That is absolutely not true. Um, what happens with adoption is that is two things. One, if you adopt and then you're subsequently pregnant, people tell the world. You never hear from the people who sort of suffer in silence or things didn't happen for them. The second thing is that with adoption, um, when people, I've seen many people who have adopted and they come back for IVF, they're not wanting to admit that it was IVF. They talk about their miracle child, but it was a miracle of technology and I was present at the conception. This does a disservice to people with expectations. And there are, I strongly believe in HIPAA and privacy and protecting people on things. But at the same time, I do see a lot of people where they talk about a spontaneous conception when it wasn't. And that shifts the expectations for everyone else out there. And you, that can be really hard because I think a lot of people are, hear these stories where people were successful spontaneously when they weren't really and thinking that could be me. The normal statistic is once people have gone through prolonged subfertility, you see about a 10 to 20 percent lifetime chance of bringing home a baby and uh, spontaneously. And that usually relates to the higher the odds, the usually the um, older uh, are the the higher the odds, the younger the person is and the older they are, the lower the chances are, because if it would have happened, it would have happened by then and your chances don't go up. Um, as you get uh, declining, have declining age um, with egg factors for things. Um, let's see, seeing a few other people. Hey, uh, Mandy. Hey, Amanda. Okay, Linda, um, uh, Lana. Um, In-house financing, I think that is a wonderful um, request. Um, and then there's also a question on uh, donor eggs. So I, first of all, I love and respect these uh, questions. For in-house financing, I can tell you I wish we could, but we probably won't. And the reason, even though we can get a lot of people loans through Bancor South and other things like that, the reason we don't want to do in-house financing is because it starts getting into us being the financial gatekeepers for things. I don't want to be in that job. I would rather let the banks do what they do well, um, but I don't want to, ex you know, I think a lot of people try to exploit people financially, um, and I want to be out of that loop. I just want to be able to say to people, how can we do right by you based on where your body is? And I don't want to, you know, we don't repossess babies or anything crazy like that, but the point is, I think you can get a little bit too much conflict of interest sometimes in practices that do in-house financing. Um, so that's why we outsource it. For having a child with donor eggs, a lot of people get pregnant. Again, we often see easily above 80, um, if not 90%. I, in fact, actually, since opening our practice, I believe everyone who's used donor egg has ultimately brought home a baby to my knowledge and are off the top of my head. Um, and so the odds are exceptionally good. Um, but again, if there are are some people who are high risk. I would never say anything is truly 100%, but the odds are exceptionally good because most people, the uterus is not a deterrent um, with exception. And consequently, if you can get good eggs from someone and then also have a normal sperm to find them, if they've got a hospitable place to implant, most people do get pregnant. And we even have refund programs for how confident we are um, for that, um, where if not pregnant, you get to get 100% of the money uh, paid in to get that get it back. Um, hey, Ashley, good to see you. Um, 
congratulations again uh, since you broadcasted and allowed us to say it. We're really happy for your success. Um, let's see, next thing um, that is there, that people talk about miscarriage increases your risk for subsequent miscarriage. That is actually part true, but it's not as bad as people think it is. If you have a miscarriage, um, the first miscarriage, instead of a 20% chance, the next pregnancy will go well, it's about 25%. Or if it's 15%, the next will be 20%. And similarly, if you have two, you go from 20% to roughly 30%. And again, these depend on age and other things. So it does a little bit, but it doesn't mean, oh my gosh, I had one miscarriage. That means 70% chance the next one will fail. You do want to have evaluation, particularly if you've had two in a row, but a lot of people have miscarriages that go on to have normal pregnancies. People just don't often talk with them, but miscarriage is very normal. The body is just inefficient with reproduction. So uh, don't think just because you had one, you will necessarily have another uh, for things. Hey, Sarah. Um, hey, Dale. Um, does taking a hot bath regularly negatively affect um, fertility? Um, so yes and no. So here's the thing. There isn't great data on it. And again, the hot bath is different from hot tubs, so to speak, which are even warmer. Um, the where I try to caution people on the hot baths, um, the ovaries are two degrees hotter than the rest of the body. So if you look at your hands and the skin, it's a lot of surface area. It can sort of vent heat if it's overheating very easily. However, if you look at the ovaries, they're inside the body, and so they can't wick away the heat very easily, and so it will retain that heat a bit more. As a result, um, I joke with people, don't boil your ovaries, and so you watch for working out in you know, sauna-like conditions or sometimes in the Mississippi summers. or Again, hot baths tend to be a little bit shorter, but it's not likely to radically shift things. That being said, could people? I encourage people while they're trying to go a little bit less. I don't think there's good data. I think the magnitude of effect is probably small, but um, it's. I think it's most likely a myth. But if it's true, it's a subtle effect and it isn't make or break for most people. That's how I look at that one. Um, let's see. You can tell whether it's a boy or a girl by the heart rate. That was another one I had on the list. Um, I have to look back. I think it is, I forget whether, I think it's girls have a slightly higher heart rate for things. I'd have to look at it again, where it was about two to five beats per minute higher. That may be true, but honestly, a baby's heart rate can go up by 20, 30, 40 beats per minute easily over the course of a minute. So if you're just looking at a two to five beat per minute difference, but it changes by 40, there is so much natural variation you won't be able to prove it. So I would say that may be statistically true, but clinically you can't really use heart rate to predict gender. Or if you are, you have a 50% chance of being right. Um, next myth I had, you will deliver on your due date. I actually had a cool night I remember back in residency where I had two women who delivered babies on their birthdays, two women the same night, and we calculated that would be once every 15 years for that institution. Those are really rare. Um, the odds of delivering on your due date are about 5%. We classically say it's 40 weeks or really 38 weeks from the ovulation. Um, the reality is the average gestational age of delivery is now closer to 39 weeks than 40 weeks. Um, but there's so many things that go on it and it depends on whether you have risk for preeclampsia, preterm labor, gestational diabetes, all these other things that go on. It, it's ballpark, but uh, people use the term in OB EDC for estimated date of confinement. And I hate thinking of your delivery as a confinement, um, but at least uh, due date is ballpark the term, yes. So um, it's close, but not perfect. Um, next, um, hey Hannah, good to see you. Uh, uh, the, the twins were the same several times. I didn't get what that was for for uh, Amanda, but uh, uh, again, uh, I'd say the body, everyone has variation and uh, on uh, what happens. Uh, uh, let's see, uh, for Alana, um, the, uh, you know, I'm open-minded. Um, 
to a lot of things. There are lots of ways. I would say this is getting a little bit more detail than I can do um, over the, uh, live broadcast. I can't do HIPAA violations or anything like that. Um, so I'm just really giving general advice. Give us a call. We can figure out something to try to do right by you. There are some solutions uh, for these things. Uh, oh, the heartbeats uh, for things for a minute. Um, so the heartbeats, the fact that, um, you know, uh, oh, yeah, the, absolutely, the heartbeats uh, can completely fool you for things. Um, so, yeah, agreed. Um, next is um, worrying about a period will delay it. So that is absolutely a myth. Um, first of all, uh, if you are a week before your period and you worry about it, you have already ovulated. You, again, ovulation occurs two weeks usually before a period. And so if you've already ovulated, that guy's cast, that you know, uh, horse is out of the barn, so to speak, it will determine you're either going to be pregnant or have a period. So worrying about it won't change it. Now where it can be true is if there's an extreme of stress you won't ovulate, and then if you don't ovulate, then you won't be having your period on time. That is actually true, but it's very rare for people to have extreme stress to the point that they don't have their periods. Not that I don't see it, but most people uh, don't. It's kind of interesting where you see, um, again, areas of ethnic cleansing, genocide, World War II, where actually fertility rates minimally change. What's interesting for when people stop having periods is if you just have people exercise a lot, about 20% stop having periods. If you have them eat next to nothing, about 20% and stop having their periods. If they have extreme stress, roughly 20% stop having their periods. But if you combine any of those two, about 80% stop having their periods. And um, again, this is a, a research that actually came out of um, uh, North Carolina, and I'm can't think of the name of it, uh, the place. It's it's eluding me right now, but I can think of the person and uh, who she was ma uh, married to. Hey, Jessica. Um, I don't remember, but she did all these experiments with monkeys, and it's uh, uh, it'll come to me uh, later for things. She was married to Dr. Taylor, but um, anyway, and she was the chair at um, oh, Wake Forest. There we go. Okay, it'll come to me later. Uh, anyway, so yes, yeah, stress is very rare to cause um, uh, not having a period, as well as stress is very rare to um, keep you from getting pregnant. Despite what the internet and the society will have you do where they try to get you to blame yourself, the reality is there are only two main ways stress causes infertility. One, again, if you aren't releasing eggs, yes, it's hard to get pregnant. The other, if you're stressed and you start fighting with each other and uh, then you end up um, not having sex because you've been uh, going back and forth of things, yeah, you're less likely to get pregnant. Beyond that, stress has minimal impact on fertility. Another one which people also do is say, well, because infertility is stress, I'm going to take a break and then try again in a few years and see what happens. That works really, really poorly. You will never probably be more fertile than you are right now. And so taking a break and getting a few years older where the eggs are worse quality doesn't usually help. People gain weight as they get older. You know, being older and having pure quality eggs, um, or as well as having that extra few pounds, can also make people more resistant to medications. Um, fibroids can appear, polyps can appear. So usually delaying doesn't work in people's favor. Um, so I would avoid that type of advice. Um, okay. Um, the um you can yeah lana just give us a call and we can absolutely talk about things for uh, where to go with it um the next is um uh, fertility medications cause women to be emotionally labile i um i would say that's true and then not true there are all kinds of things like that so first I think a lot of people are intolerant of women's emotions in the first place. I think a lot of people need to understand that people going through a lot, and that's not the fertility medication, you should be there and you should support them. Now, for fertility medications, if you're taking Clomid, everyone tells me, oh my gosh, Clomid turned me into the devil. Clomid is miserable. 
And so I don't deny that. I'm not going to mince words. That's horrible. Letrozole, especially on the lower doses, tends to be a little more gentle. And uh, so especially if you're in the 5 milligram range, um, you know, 12.5, we do see it more fatigue, other things like that. But um, usually we try to stick to medications that are a little more gentle. Now, Lupron for IVF, if you're getting hot flashes because things have been shut down for the ovaries, that can be hard, but then you just give estrogen to sort of add things back. That can help a little bit. And then, of course, of course, also, um, when you're getting stimulation and your ovaries are 10 times their normal size, I would say that's not that's a response to medications more than the medications itself. But I, I tell people, look, if my testicles were 10 times their size, I would be uncomfortable. I'd be having issues for mood, all those other things. So I think the fact that women are taking one for the team and having you know the effects of eggs growing and all these other issues they should be supported in it so um it's a little bit of myth a little bit true uh depends on what they get um next is if you want it badly enough it will happen i think this is one of the th myths that really needs to be busted now granted people who are motivated are more likely to get results if you're lazy fair oh, it'll happen or not most likely if you're passive things don't happen but if you are wanting it just because your heart is set on it, that doesn't mean it necessarily will. I think um, there are a lot of people where they say, well, faith can move mountains. And that's true. Faith can. But at the same time, I see a lot of people who have incredible faith. And I don't think God loves them less or hates them or anything simply because they aren't having the pregnancy. And so I think people need to reach a point where they realize whether they get pregnant or not, it's not a factor in who their moral integrity is or of their relationship with God. Um, it happens to often just be biology, and sometimes it just needs a little bit of support to help people get where they need from the medical side. Um, the uh, fresh versus frozen, um, and banked eggs. So if you're go so for banked eggs, it's very easy to um, fertilize them when you have them, and then uh, go forward. Fresh versus frozen. There's a little bit of a hit if your ovaries are revved up. Um, you can actually have it so that um, your body needs to cool down a little bit in order to do better. But then also freezing things can also take a little bit of a toll on the embryo. I would say fresh versus frozen, they are mostly equivalent at this point. Hi, Brandy. Hi, Lindsay. Hi, Tracy. Good to see you all. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, one last one that I think I'll do just as the final fertility myth, since I've been talking a lot and I want to take up everyone's time. And I love, again, thank you all for having come uh, today, is that a doctor won't see you until you've been trying for a year. Now, that's not true. First of all, if you have an underlying risk factor, you don't have to have a tubal ligation and then try for a year in effect before you see a doctor. If you are anovulatory and you're not releasing eggs, or if you have advanced endometriosis, get things looked into. You know what's there. That completely makes sense. Insurance, first of all, in Mississippi is horrible for uh, infertility. But the thing is, if you are at a point where you need to do it, some insurers have some requirements that are ridiculous, but the doctor will see you otherwise, and they can still sometimes get you on the right path. The other thing is some people shouldn't wait a year. For instance, if you're over 35, and especially if you're over 40, if you're over 35, I'd give it, again, six months, and if you're over 40, I'd give it three months if there are no other risk factors. But I think people should be willing to support you wherever you are, and we're always happy to help. Um, I think that was, mo I have more myths I think I will not overdo it, but thank you all for tuning in, and I love all the posts. I appreciate everything that you guys are giving for advice for what we need to talk about. Send me more. Tag them on to the end of this uh, video, and I'll use them for the next one uh, for the December edition. And uh, again, have a wonderful Thanksgiving, and uh, God bless, and may you all get everything that you're looking for in relationships, in life and in family. Thank you.